Uh, I wanted to read part of a story called You that was first published in The Sun and um, just recently uh, reprinted in Junior Great Books, um, which I read as a kid growing up and from second through eighth grade. And um, it was where I first encountered the short story, first encountered Ray Bradbury. Um, and so I was really thrilled um, that my story that my work gets to be part of the curriculum. Um, I think of this story as, uh, it's, it's fictional, but as a love letter from, imagine love letter from my mom to me, and then from me as my daughter, me to my daughter. You. Your father tells me he wants to turn your bedroom, the empty bedroom he calls it, as he has stopped talking about you and will not say your name into a guest room. Except, when was the last time anyone visited us here at the edge of the city? Perhaps your room should be a second floor den, he suggests. There's too much light in the room for a den, I tell him. We gave you the brightest room in the house, you know. Then what should the room become, he asks. I was thinking we should leave it as it is, with the window open and the screen removed. That is a very bad idea, your father says. He insists the windows remain closed and locked, as if you now are an unwelcome, a destructive force. Are you a destructive force? I love you as you are now, I told you, when the only difference I could see was a turquoise hue to your skin, to your forehead in particular, and your neck. Can you remember that I told you this? So what, you won't love me after I've changed, you ask, rubbing your hand, which was still a hand then. I didn't answer. The reason I didn't answer is I'm not sure love works like that. Love, not just my love, but anybody's, can't possibly apply to all the potential forms a person, even a daughter, might take, can it? This is love's failure of vision, not mine. You used to look like me. Can you remember that too? Early on, I thought about wiping your memory. I might as well admit this to you now. I thought maybe if you stopped believing you were something else on the inside, then you wouldn't be sad anymore and you wouldn't change. This was before your body really began to transform. The only reason I didn't go through with the memory wipe was the cost, which was prohibitive. At one point you left a guide for parents on my side of the bed. This was after that fringe scarf you always wore no longer hid the scales on your chest. There were too many for you to cover now. The guide was a list of do's and don'ts. The list of don'ts was substantially longer. We were not to ask, what is wrong with you? Or why are you changing? Or when can I drive you to the doctor? Or what is happening to your fingernails? Or what about having children? Or what about being happy? Or what about being normal? If you badger your changing child with such aggressive questioning, advise the guide your child will flee into the trees and never be seen again. Your father and I asked you such questions anyway. We sat you down one afternoon in our spotless kitchen, which has always been your least favorite room of the house. And we asked you those questions and more. I thought it was our right as parents to ask. Your skin sparkling in the sunlight was distracting. Your answers were brief or vague if you answered at all. I'll never want children, you said. Just you wait, I replied, thinking you surely would later on as I had. The next morning you sprang away from me into the old silver maple in our yard. Up you climbed effortlessly, scattering the squirrels. I thought you might not come back down. I was lonely watching you climb higher into the tree, ignoring the branches that tore at your hair. Your father had left for a business trip. The suitcase he had taken with him was extremely large, as if he would be away for a long time. Perhaps I should have texted him a video of you clinging to the tree's crown, or would he have deleted it? In any case, before I could even take a picture, you took flight. So she could fly now, I thought. I, knew, I know it is no longer supposed to be extraordinary to see those of your generation flying and whatever else you do. 
Many mothers in our neighborhood remain inside these days and stare ashamedly and hopefully out their windows in the direction of the sky. They call to each other from their porches and take turns speaking their daughter's names. You were beautiful when you flew, your sinuous vein wings extended for the first time, your blue-green skin trailing behind you. Or maybe it wasn't your skin. I don't know how to describe you anymore. I'm told the younger generation is growing disinterested in maintaining a stable form. You were beautiful to me too many years ago when you sat close to me in the kitchen and shared a quiet dinner of pasta garnished with cut tomatoes, when you were still wingless and looked like a little girl, when you were a girl. Couldn't there be something dazzling and worthwhile in such a simple memory in its ordinariness and lack of fire and magic? You didn't need to grow wings to be beautiful. I was never a girl, you said to me, despite the photographs. I stacked in front of you my piles of proof. What were you then, I asked. I was something else, you said. But you didn't look like something else, I reminded you. You looked like a girl. You looked like my child. I was never your child, not really. I don't think all your answers to my questions were correct. In the old stories, the myths, your sort of transformation would have happened through a curse. You might have angered a god, and that god might have turned you into something else, some sort of animal, a swan or a cow. I would have preferred that. I could have learned how to care for a cow. People would have understood and pitied me, and you as well. Rarely have I heard any myths about a young woman choosing to turn into something unrecognizable all on her own. We were not in need of a new type of story, you know. I burned the parent's guide in the fireplace in our family room while you were crouched in the tree. Then I considered wiping my own memory, but of course we didn't have money for that either. I might have been able to change too in less dramatic ways at an earlier point in my life, but I did what was expected of me. There is something to be said for doing what is expected of us, for becoming what is expected. Another time I saw you hunched behind the garage beside the compost pile, engaged in some repetitive action that I didn't understand, doing something with your, with whatever replaced your hands. It looked as if you were digging. You were digging with frustration and urgency. I didn't know how to help, so I knelt beside you. Eventually I dug with you. Can you remember this, that there was nothing buried in the soil? We found nothing. Then I reached out and touched a part of you, a leftover part of who you had been. I had always wanted a daughter, I used to think. As my daughter grows, I will have so much to share with her. I will teach her how to watch without sadness, the afternoon light fade in the kitchen. I will teach her to apologize, even when it isn't her fault, to keep the peace in her house, and how to rub away a child's growing pains in the dark, and how to make promises you always intended to keep and the comfort that comes with knowing one's future for the rest of one's life. What can I teach you in your current state? What do you need to know that I could tell you? You were always a little bored of me. We did not have much to talk about even in the beginning. Can you at least try to remember our silences as comfortable? I did my best to fill the silence between us with love. This is not about my love anymore, is it? This is not about you at all, you have said to me. But I am the one telling the story. Try to remember that. It's only fair that the person who is left behind gets to tell the story. This is a very different story, I know, from the one you would tell. You had begun to stand in front of the wall mirror in my bedroom without a shirt on. This was around the time you turned 12. The scales had not yet emerged and your skin was not yet discolored. So I assumed wrongly that you were taking note of how puberty was affecting your body. I wanted to sit you down and tell you about the changes that were happening so you would not fumble blindly into sexual maturity as I had. When I asked, what do you know about how pregnancy happens? You walked to the other side of the room. That doesn't apply to me, mom, you said from the doorway. Oh, girls your age, they all say that sort of thing at first, I assured you. Several times I tried to restart the conversation, but you refused to engage with me. You wanted to talk instead about what you saw when you looked in the mirror. 
You said you saw two wings extending from your upper back. You asked what I saw when I looked at myself in the mirror. Did I have wings? I did not have wings. You asked, do you see my wings? I did not yet see yours, though at times I thought I could feel them brushing rhythmically against my shoulders. I'll stop there. Thanks.